Uh, we're super excited to have you here. Um, feel free to connect with me. I'm an open networker. And, and you know what I try to exemplify in this admissions process is the kind of intimacy and connection that you'll have throughout the course of the program. So feel free to scan the QR code, connect with me on LinkedIn, or send me an email. Um, you know, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, ASB is a product of the need for world-class talent in Malaysia, the region, and the emerging world. And we were brought together by Bank Nagara and uh, MIT Sloan, and ASB is a product of that. And our intention and our mission is to kind of be a talent magnet and multiplier for the region. And one of the things I always say is that um, it's not a matter of if Asia is going to grow, it's, it's really about if it's going to fulfill its expectations. And that, that's our goal here. Uh, MIT Sloan is, is here to provide the kind of academic excellence and rigor uh, from an educational perspective. And Bank Nagar Malaysia is here to provide the asset and human resource support. And, and so we're, we're really excited about our program. This is our, uh, we're nearing the end of our fifth year of existence. And so we're excited to have our sixth birthday uh, coming soon. One of the things that separates us is that you know, our mission mandate is to be a premier school of management in Asia. We want to be the best business school in this part of the world. We also want to be recognized for developing transformative and principal leaders. Uh, but where we really stand out and where we're really different is that we want to contribute to the advancement of the emerging world with a particular focus on Asia. And so that's how we look to uh, distinguish ourselves. And when we, you know, we, a lot of schools put these words on paper, but I feel really confident that we are a mission aligned organization, really working towards uh, achieving this goal. Now, ASB's MBA programs are designed for two profiles of individuals. Uh, you know, typically that and they fall into the, the traditional MBA program and the MBA for working professionals. The two profiles revolve around career changers, mainly for the MBA program and career accelerators for the MBA WP program. Uh, this, it's not, you know, exclusive to, you know, it's not one profile for each program. In the MBA program, we have some career accelerators. In the uh, WP program, we have some career changers. And so it's a case by case basis. Uh, throughout the process, we make ourselves available to help you balance and figure out which program is the right fit. And so feel free to reach out to us if you don't have clarity. Hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll have clarity and then listening to our, our fantastic student panel will also give you some clarity. Um, when we talk about the MBA for uh, working professionals program specifically, uh, we think there's three distinct features, right? There's this Asia and emerging world perspective, there's learning in action, and then there's that MIT Sloan rigor. And we do this over a 22 month modular format. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've been renowned for is action learning. And what we've done with action learning is evolve it and adapt it for the working professional market so that people can take uh, the, the gains that they see in classroom and put them into execution at, at work real time. But also we have your kind of traditional action learning that's done uh, in three practicums that are conducted across Malaysia and ASEAN. Uh, and, and, you know, faculty wise, 50% of our, our traditional courses are taught by MIT Sloan faculty, 50% are taught by ASB's resident faculty, so that MIT DNA is inculcated in the program. Also, uh, at the end of the first year, typically, you know, COVID permitting, uh, we spend four weeks on campus at MIT Sloan. And then the other thing that I think differentiates our program, and one of the reasons we don't call this a part-time MBA program, is because we also incorporate professional development and executive coaching in the program, because it's not enough to prepare you academically. We also want to give you the skills that help you ascend in your career. We, we think there's you know, four critical elements of our value proposition. Uh, we, we're really looking for people who are frontier-minded and impact-oriented, who are looking to build a global career, not just in Malaysia or just ASEAN, we're preparing you for the world. And when we think about the, the, those four elements that MIT Sloan DNA is one thing, but the Asian context, which I think uh, you'd be surprised in this part of the world, some of the uh, Asian business schools actually struggle providing Asian context because most of their work focuses on things related to the United States or the Western world. Here, we're really uh, embedded in what's going on in this part of the world. 
Also with learning, the learning in action curriculum, we're facilitating career transformation for our working professionals. So they're not necessarily changing jobs like a full-time MBA student, but they're getting promotions or their roles are expanding or they're able to opportunistically switch uh, when the occasion presents itself. And, and then you know, this results in great global outcomes. We'll talk about that some more. And then we have market leading financial aid. We recognize that uh, this program is a significant investment from a time and monetary standpoint. And so we want to provide access to people who may have financial challenges getting to the program. So, so with all that, we feel our value proposition is really without peer in Malaysia, Asia, and, and throughout the world. Um, we're, we're excited about our, our working professional program. We're in our second cohort. And so far we have 35 students total. Last year we had 18. This year we had 17. I think the uncertainty with COVID kind of slowed down our growth with this year's cohort, but we're really excited. They're a fantastic group. Uh, about 80% of our students are Malaysian, but 20% are international, about 30% are female. And we've got 19 different companies recommend uh, uh, participating in the program. Um, and the nationalities, we've got folks from Germany, Malaysia, the Philippines, South Korea, Vietnam, Thailand. And so we're, we're looking forward to continue to grow that diversity as well. One of the other benefits of being in this program is not only do you have access to uh, the, your, your classmates and your cohort of the Working Professionals Program, but for the in-person weeks when you're in class, you'll also take uh, those classes with, uh, usually we time those classes when MIT faculty are here, and you'll be taking them with full-time MBA students. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. Uh, you get to build a network with our full-time MBA students who are global. Uh, they, there's 82 of them. Uh, about the full-time program is about two thirds international, 42% female, uh, 29 different countries. I think since we've been, uh, since the start of the program, we've had 37 different countries come through the program. And so I think this is just a way to also give you a future globally distributed network. Uh, and, um, you know, beyond that, uh, we had a record full-time, a record full-time class, you know, with 50 students, about 50% more than the prior year. And we would have had even more had it not been for COVID. So there's a lot of momentum here at, at the Asia School of Business. This January, uh, at the beginning of the call, for some of you that may have walked in and heard me talking to Fazilla, we're actually moving into our new building. Uh, it's a purpose-built campus for the future. Uh, I call it the Death Star of business schools. Not sure if you guys are familiar with Walmart, uh, but like uh, I think this is the size of six Walmarts. Uh, and so it's, it's got a massive footprint. And rest assured, social distancing will not be a problem, uh, especially in the early days of the program. Uh, if you look in the left corner, uh, uh, lower left corner, you'll see the white buildings are the residential uh, campus. So when, uh, when you come to campus, this is where are the students stay from the Working Professionals Program. And on the right, that's the main academic building. This is a quick view of the facilities, uh, our, our suites. We have a, a nice gym with top-notch equipment. And it's just a really comfortable environment to work, study, and collaborate. Now, one of the things that I always think is important when we talk about the MBA program is why the MBA, particularly in Asia. And I'm, I'm a strong believer that MBAs are ideally suited for what Asia, uh, specific, Asia Pacific needs at this specific time, all right? Uh, and, and so, and why do I say that? I, you know, the, the economic gap between the G7 and the rest of the world continues to close, especially with Asia, right? There's a, there's a huge need for talent. Uh, China is moving up the value add chain and has become more of a service economy. And so down the supply chain, this is uh, creating an opportunity uh, for ASEAN to pick up some of the slack uh, because of China's migration. So we see there is a, a, a tremendous amount of opportunity there. And then there's just a huge talent deficit in the region. Uh, we have, you know, you have two kind of poles and factors that are driving that. And in some, a lot of developing Asia and uh, North Asia, you have an older population base, China from the one child policy, Korea and Japan, just because as economies, advanced economies continue to mature, the, 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 the population tends to get older. But then on the other end, you've got really young economies like uh, Indonesia, India, et cetera. And, and they, they, don't, they haven't grown and matured uh, the workforce yet through their education system. So it's a great time for MBAs to really be on that frontier of what's happening. If, if you also think about Industry 4.0, 
the you know the the nature of skills that are needed in the future are changing. You know, you're you're having more automation, autonomous systems, machine learning, things of that nature, and so it's going to require a different kind of person in the workforce. Uh, the, the the fourth industrial revolution is really you know shortening the average tenure of, of a job, and the skill half life is rapidly declining. So in a recent Deloitte study. Uh, they say the half-life of a learned skill now is only five years. And for skills that are more technical in nature, say like programming or coding, it's as low as 18 months. And so what the workforce really needs uh, in Asia and in this fast evolving environment is a generalist skill set. And it's in high demand in Asia. Uh, why is this? There's too much uncertainty in today's business environment. Companies mostly hire discipline skills in the early stage of career but hires eventually have to rely on generalist skills. Um, also, what we're finding you know, through the research is the ideological, ideological reliance on a single perspective is really uh, detrimental to a firm's ability to navigate in this uh, vague, evolving, and poorly defined situation, right? Uh, now, which we also find with the generalists is that their ability to you know, master multiple functions make them more valuable because management can dynamically adjust their roles and deploy them in various different ways. And, and professionals armed with analytical capabilities uh, develop via, via experiences, right? Uh, will outperform domain uh, specific skill development over the long term. And, and so well, our takeaway is that there really isn't enough generalists in Asia. And, and so for us, one of the things that, you know, the MBA, what we see is a generalist degree and it, this isn't just us saying it. This isn't just research amongst academics and scholars that are saying it. If you just look at the market, you'll see what's going on here. And um, this chart talks about the annual lies increases in salaries three years after graduation over the last uh, 10 years, right? Uh, last 10 years for MBA programs, and then the last five year for EMBA working professional programs. And, and what you see is that uh, in Asia, you know, seven out of the 10 top uh, working professional programs are, are Asian, right? Um, the rate of salary progression for working professionals is faster than full-time MBA professional or graduates. Um, MBAs in Europe, and MBAs in Asia are, are fastly outperforming uh, career progression of those in USA and Europe. And studies show that the ROA of all MBAs uh, uh, Studies that look at all MBAs uh, show significantly less returns. So, but what that really means is quality matters. So sometimes in, in the popular press, people say, oh, the MBA doesn't matter, or this, that, or the other. And if you look at the high quality MBA, say like the Financial Times Top 100 schools or schools affiliated with places like MIT, we're still garnering strong salary growth and things of that nature. What you also see, you know, something for, you know, to consider as a working professional, if you look at this chart, working professional MBA program grads outperform full-time grads because one of the things that happens when you go full-time is you do disrupt your career momentum, right? So if you're still working and you're in a good situation with your company, you can maintain that momentum career-wise and you'll see a, a, you know, your salary progression will probably go up, all right? Now, how has ASB responded to the market? So, you know, what we've really tried to do is think about a curriculum that you know, augments, you know, where humanity can augment technology, right? And we view this through sharp and smart skills. Now you might say, what are, what are sharp and smart skills? Sharp skills, you know, uh, is our uh, kind of interpretation of what commonly has been known as hard skills. These are things like system dynamics, digital marketing, finance, data analytics, et cetera, right? Uh, and these are the skills you need to get things done. But then there are smart skills Kind of non-domain specific skills that can be applied across a myriad of different uh, uh, d domains. Uh, they're critical thinking, emotional maturity, growth mindset, uh, problem solving, creativity, uh, and, and um, uh, creativity, discipline, all these things, right? And, and so in our program, it's really designed to help bring out these skills. Now, now how do we do that? Uh, what, we're what we've been known for is our action learning curriculum. Uh, we've received a lot of acclaim through our full-time MBA program, but the way we're, we're doing this in the working professional program is kind of a twist on this, learning in action, right? And this is an evolution for working professionals. 
So the, the original concept of action learning came from MIC Sloan, but ASB basically put it on steroids. Uh, and what we did in that program is we did action learning every semester and, and it's yielded transformational results. But the working professional program, learning and action courses, they teach you how to take what you learn in the classroom and apply it immediately to your job, your department, or your company. Our, our Professor Laura Donna, I'm sure some of you have already participated in some of our other web webinars and things of that nature. Uh, the course is taught by her, but then you also have the ability to learn from other ASB academic and business coaches, uh, people from industry, leading scholars, and it, you know, you're able to make real-time gains. And, and for those of you guys who are looking for sponsorship, part of your articulation to your management can be uh, the ability to put into action things that you get in the classroom real time. Now, our curriculum is, uh, you know, it's a general management curriculum, right? And so what we do is we have, uh, uh, we have, you know, the standard core. And this year, one of the things that we've done, uh, and then what you do is you, you meet every basically six weeks for a week at a time while you're in the program. Uh, we'll have other info sessions where we, we talk about the structure and the curriculum. But this is, lays out our core curriculum. We offer a, a wide array of electives. We have the MIT Sloan experience. We have learning in actions, business practicums. And then this year we launched a concentration in finance and analytics. Oops, finance and analytics. And um, what we, we, we wanted to capitalize off our banking, uh, our central banking expertise. And so for those who are interested in that concentration, the electives are slightly different. You have to take asset-based pricing, behavioral finance, data science for managers, et cetera. So, so a rich and robust curriculum, whether you're looking for a general concentration or a, a, a finance and analytics concentration. The results for our program have been compelling, right? So we have a little bit of data with our full-time MBA program. The salaries for our graduates would really rank, uh, would already rank 52nd in the world. Now that's, and that would be in the Financial Times top 100 global MBA rankings. And that's comparing our graduates with uh, alums three years after graduation. So what we anticipate is when our alums are three years after graduation, our rank would be even higher. The other thing that's very compelling about our, 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 our outcomes is that in the class of 2019 of 35, our students were placed in 14 different countries across five different columns, uh, continents. And so that really kind of reinforces what I was talking about earlier, where our students are you know, globally oriented and our degree is portable and it travels well. We've already seen some transform transformative impact uh, from entrepreneurs and self-sponsored career changers and uh, accelerators in the program. And then last year, before the completion of the end of the first year, 61% of our students received a promotion, uh, a change in title, or an expansion of responsibilities. And this is you know, higher than rates that I've seen in this profession. Uh, typically, 50% you know, of the students get promoted after graduating the program, right? And so, so we're ahead of the game. And I think it's a combination of what we're doing in the classroom and the environment that's here in Asia for our students to capitalize upon. We have some great student success stories. Uh, Paul Lim uh, recently just uh, changed jobs to a solar uh, panel uh, startup in Hong Kong. Adil is a he was, came here with he's an entrepreneur and had his own business and he's been taking the skills he learned uh, in class and putting them into practice. Nick Aisha, uh, she's been promoted to the head of group treasury. Uh, and uh, oops, I didn't change. Uh, that's not Moxoff. That's Raphael Bowen but everything else about him is correct. Uh, he's based in Japan and he flies to campus to participate in the program. He's, he's been promoted as well. So we're, we're excited about the outcomes that we've had. Also earlier, I talked about the financial aid. We've got corporate funding. Uh, you know, the ways people can pay for it is either corporate funding, self-funding, needs-based financial aid, where we give financial aid packages up to 60% of tuition based on your financial need. And we also have two fellowships that are available uh, through different application processes. Uh, these fellowships, and this information is on the website, uh, you have to apply for the first round of admissions. There are 40% fellowships uh, that uh, require you to complete an essay uh, and submit uh, when, when you submit your application. Now, uh, the first deadline for the working professional program is March 16. 
Uh, one of the things that we do, do do though is if you apply now, we will evaluate your application in round with the full-time students. So you could get a decision within six weeks. And then uh, the second round and the final round is June 16th. Our only requirements are a bachelor's degree, two years of work experience, and proof of English language proficiency. So just to recap uh, our, um, our program, uh, again, you know, the value proposition, the MIT Sloan DNA with an Asian context, the transformational learning and action curriculum, strong uh, global career outcomes, and market leading financial aid is really what separates us from other schools. Now, the best part of this session is with our, our students, all right? And so we've got Mazra, uh, she's working for Syme Darby. She's a vice assistant vice president of corporate finance. Merlin, he's uh, working at Sapporo Energy. Uh, I think he was just recently promoted, correct, Merlin, to the Supply Chain Management Task Force as a category lead. And then yes, Matthew, and Matthew, he's an a, a entrepreneur from the Philippines. And so, uh, so let's go ahead and get into the panel. We're excited, they're fantastic students, and I, I, I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy. And so before we get started, I, could I get each of you to kind of introduce yourselves a little bit about your background, where you went to school, uh, what made you want to do an MBA, and, and you know, uh, and a little bit about your background. So let, let's start, ladies first. Mazra. Hi, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Mazra, um, as you can see. Um, I, I've worked in Sime Darby for about ten years now. They actually sponsored me to do my undergraduate, which is um, I studied chemical engineering in the Imperial College of London. And then, but then once I joined Sime Darby, I decided more of a business or more of a, uh, well, actually corporate finance and m and So I've been doing that for many years now. Uh, I've, along the way, I've also become a CFA charter holder. So yeah, I'm quite concentrated in, in, in CF, in m and And I think the MBA was high time for me to diversify and, and become more of a generalist. All right, fantastic. Mer Merlin? Hi, everyone. Nice to see everyone joining in tonight. Um, my name's Merlin. I'm from Sapura Energy. Um, I studied mechanical engineering. I started working as an engineer, rose all the way to a manager, but focused mostly in projects. So then I thought I should, being a manager, I should you know, expand more. I did an online program just to get a feel how it's like to get back to studying. That was when I decided, you know, I should do an MBA. And if it's an MBA, I want something that's uh, rewarding to me. So um, I ended up in uh, Asia School of Business, no regrets. Um, just within less than a year, I changed role. Uh, thanks also for from the experience in ASB. I moved straight from projects all the way to corporate, uh, where we actually do uh, a special task force just to look at the supply chain for the entire company and report to senior management and actually putting into action a lot that we learned uh, in ASB uh, right, uh, right at work. And I, I must uh, add on to Sean's point, I, the action learning really did help. And I think like my last action learning project that I did under the working professionals, I actually actualized it just last week. So the savings and the actual work that gone through all those that you learn in theory in school, I actually put it and actually implemented it. And we actually realized about 4.8 million ringgit in savings. So it, it's something that's very practical that I enjoy uh, being in ASB without having to wait till you graduate to, act, to fully reap the benefits of it. Thank you, Mervlin. Uh, um, Matthew, would you like to tell us a little bit about your story? Sure, hi, uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you may be. So I'm Matthew Roman. I'm an entrepreneur from Manila, Philippines. I've been an entrepreneur for a little bit over 10 years now, Sean. So I started my first business when I was 23. I exited that a few years ago, and then I started my second uh, company. So it's a startup still. Um, but uh, I guess what 
what really drove me for an MBA is my first startup grows to the size of doing national projects here in the Philippines. But the aim for the second startup is we're more in the enterprise tech automation space. So we want to actually grow our company to across Southeast Asia, Asia, and then the world. So th there is a need for, um, let's say, a different set of skills uh, that, that we need to know to chart our path uh, towards this growth. And so that's why it necessitated, I guess, for me to actually equip myself with a global MBA. And um, I guess I kind of have the same story as Melvin, uh, where I had some super high expectations, Sean, right? So uh, <laughs> before I enrolled, I was talking to Sean a lot and uh, I had some super high expectations about this, but um, man, four weeks into the program, all the expectations have just been blasted away. Um, so much have been exceeded. And uh, actually with just one course, which is our ops for in four weeks, I, I ROI'd my tuition already, Sean. So um, it's really awesome. Uh, th this experience is quite phenomenal. And uh, I, I think with all of the things that you learn and more importantly, you'll be putting into action. Um, I, I think it's worth, uh, it's worth more than, than the investment itself, I think. Thanks for the insight, guys. Uh, really fantastic uh, getting to know you guys. Uh, so one of the things I want to dig in on a little bit more is I think we've talked about some of the some of the things that excite you. Uh, we've heard uh, learning in action multiple times, but um, I wanted to think what are some of the other things that excited you and um, really kind of were the catalyst for you selecting ASB. There are a lot of great MBA programs out there, um, but like what what drove the decision for ASB? Hi, Sean, if I may go. Please. Yeah, so I think uh, kind of to add on to what you said earlier, it's about it being a really good career progression for me because I, I'm, I'm assuming those of you guys who have logged on might be, you know, some people will be contemplating between the full-time program and the WP program, actually. So um, what if, to me, if you have a good job, you've got goodwill with your company, you've got momentum, and, and you don't really want to get out of it, but you know you want to do more. I, found, I find that, um, so, so what attracted me to ASB was that it has a very interesting and well-structured program for working professionals. And it's not one of those, like you said, part-time weekend study uh, takes two, anywhere between two to four years. It's completely different. It's properly structured for you with you in mind. And then at the same time, you guys have somehow managed to blend us and the full-timers together to, I, I think to a very, very, um, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time with the full-timers and so we don't feel like our own little offshoot cohort kind of thing. So, so yeah, I, I think that's, that's quite, that's very interesting because I've not heard of another program like this around the region. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think uh, another thing I, I thought as well was that because you guys are set up by Bank Nagara and MIT, I felt that, okay, that's, I have confidence in those institutions. You know, you guys are reputable. Um, you know, it's not your average uh, MBA on the side, like some people would do. Matt, Rovin, anything you guys want to add to that? Uh... Yeah, sure. Um, well, definitely, I, I mean, I do want to echo all the things that Maestra has said. Uh, there is sometimes some confusion that the the WP program is somehow a little bit less than the full-time program. It's absolutely not. It's the same level and quality of education you get. It's just a different context wherein rather than learning things, uh, let's say through action learning, you're learning your courses by applying it to your existing job. So you have all these coaches, all of these professors who are just there behind your back to make sure that you succeed in terms of making sure that everything you're learning every day in the classroom is something that you can actually apply to your workplace. And secondly, it's, um, it's so unique because uh, it is a global MBA program, but you are studying it from an, with an Asian lens. So you are learning how things, how to operate a, from a global caliber of education, but within your own region, right? So, um, and I guess also I think Sean, lastly, the one was, uh, you know, I think here we're encouraged to be ourselves. We're not being 
trained to be robots graduating with a specific skill set. Like we're graduating to be generalists. So that doesn't mean that we're not good in any specializations. It just means we're good in any specializations. And not only can we do that, we can even manage all of those specializations. So I think that's what that's what sold me, Sean. So, <laughs> so I, I want to touch on one thing, uh, Matt. So like you being in the Philippines, not being in Malaysia, what, what, what kind of pushed you over the edge? Oh, well, um, well, you know, it's com your comfort zones, right? So, uh, I mean, you, obviously your first inclination is to take a, a course here, but you know, knowing the path that we're headed, that where there's no such thing as a local business anymore, every business is global. You have to kind of approach all the things that you learn, all the experiences that you take uh, from a global perspective. So that kind of pushed me outside of, of or kind of, forced me to push myself outside of my comfort zone. And so I started looking for the best schools in my region, even, even out, actually outside of Asia. But I felt that ASB was the best fit just because of the things that I need to do and, and my plans for, for my company and myself. Fantastic. And Rovin? I, I got to echo what they say. I know this sounds, um, this sounds very, uh, it's not a hard sell, but it's really the the unique uh, proposition of ASB is that you actually go in, um, you study for a week, and then you actually get to apply it immediately at work. And what works, what doesn't work, you get that first-hand experience where you could actually feed back, back to whether it's your professors or your business coaches. Um, one thing that I really make use of is actually reaching out uh, back to the school uh, for resources. So whether it's your business coach or even your professor, uh, it's not just about grades. It's really just uh, taking what you learn, put it into work. And sometimes being in an Asian uh, company, you get to give that feedback to say that, hey, this doesn't work, this works. So I think that has really helped um, grow me as a person uh, at work because um, I know everyone's just looking at, oh, it's backed by Bank Nagara. It's, uh, there's the collaboration with MIT. But I think that the other part of the curriculum that helps uh, me a lot is that I'm not very comfortable like even speaking to people or even speaking on a Zoom meeting or doing um, other things like, how do you present to a board? I was a very en engineering background working in projects. So we had all those um, career development trainings that's being done by the school that really shapes you as a whole. It's not just a weekend program where you sit for a few subjects, get those grades and get your papers in the end. It really does shape you um, to be good at your job. Fantastic. Uh, let's, I'm going to stay with you, Merlin. Uh, so networking, any reflections? Sometimes I think, uh, you know, my experience has been sometimes working professional students don't appreciate uh, the amount of networking that actually happens while you're in the program, particularly in this, this COVID environment. Like, how, how would you uh, kind of, uh, what reflections would you share on your experience in networking and relationship building in this program? All right. I think one of the biggest ways to learn in the program is actually through networking. It's not just in class. I've actually connected um, with, I realized I've connected with everyone from every single batch of ASB all the way to the 2022 batch. So I have friends from every batch, whether it's the WPs or the full-timers. So I think um, that's where you actually do get to learn because um, there's really, really good talented people that uh, joins ASB. And it's just sometimes as simple as giving them a text or going out for coffee with them and um, I know networking does sometimes bring a negative context, uh, connotation to it, but it's helped me a lot with work. Sometimes you just need to know how other industries handle a certain problem. And it's not a one-way thing. It goes both ways. Like I do have uh, friends, even someone from the last batch, full-timers, today text me about something on um, property, um, not an area I work in because I work in energy, but I think we bounce ideas off just for 20, 30 minutes. And I, I hope that that helped her. Um, but when I need help also, it's very easy just to connect with them, just to understand what's going on 
uh, or how to solve a certain problems. And they really do get out of your way. Sometimes I feel bad to come and like look at what problems you're facing at work and actually brainstorm through it. So um, let's not discount networking as part of the learning experience. Anything you want to share, Mazra? Yeah, I wanted to share because, I mean, well, Mervin is in the class above me. So, you know, he's gone along this journey for quite some time now. But, you know, even in our first two weeks, our immersion week and the ops management week, you know, the career development office uh, had quite a few sessions with us to, you know, the first thing they thought, taught us was how to network, you know, how to feel comfortable in, you know, uh, small talk or, or what, how to how to get out of that kind of small talk bubble, how to make use of the time that you have with people, how to approach people. And it wasn't just a one-off session. They taught us the elevator pitch. They taught us, okay, how do you talk to people on LinkedIn? How do you approach people? And, and that's just at the start. You know, obviously they offer um, sessions where you can go to them and talk to them. But along this way, and when did we start? We started at the beginning of October, right? It's only been two months. And... <laughs> Yeah, it's only been two months, but you know there have been so many events that are held by the that are organized by the CDO, the Career Development Office, and and of course a lot of it, um, you know, maybe more geared towards the full timers because they're looking to get jobs out of that. But you know, we are invited for everything, for every single webinar, every single industry kind of uh, you know exposure. Uh, in fact sometimes too many that I can't even switch on and put in the background because I have to finish my, my own office work. But it's amazing because, yeah, I feel that within two months, there's just been so much and so much opportunity. Uh, it's all the opportunities are afforded to us as well. You know, it's up to us to make full use of it. It's there. It's there. It's offered to you. And then in terms of networking just within the students, uh, you know, there are numerous WhatsApp chats. Everybody is talking about all sorts of things. And the moment you're interested in something, you just text them straight or you just kind of join the student club, listen in after a while, say something and get involved. There's so many ways to go about it in the end. Yeah, I think you can find your community here. You want to add anything, Matthew? Yeah, sure, Sean. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I kind of get what Rolvi was saying, right? Where in kind of, some people might kind of hate networking in a way. Um, but here, I think, um, I guess, I ended up networking by accident, uh, not so that because I was meaning to, but because there's just so many great people here. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I was, I was just talking around and, and uh, making friends. But then whenever something uh, comes up, or let's say there's a specific problem that I need to solve or, or a problem they need to approach, right, or, or a particular topic. I mean, there's so many different uh, diverse people here. So if you need somebody from with mergers and acquisitions experience, VC experience, valuation and whatnot, there's a student for that. You have a classmate or senior for that. So it, it's absolutely great. Um, and, uh, and I think being in the element of that kind of takes away the negative connotations of networking. But because ASB does accept only the best of the best, we do have the best of the best classmates Ergo, we have the best of the best network as well. So that's, that's just my experience, Sean. I never really saw it as networking, per se. Yeah, I think it's um, you know, one of the things that we try to promote here, too, is that networking is it's not, it's not like, hey, I'm looking for a job. It's a way of life. It's a way of sharing. It's a way of uh, helping and contributing to the community collectively. So uh, I love the insights that you guys have had. Now, you know, one of the things that... Uh, you guys are going to school in an unprecedented time during a global pandemic. Borders are closed. There are lots of restrictions. And so um, I'm sure no one envisioned that your MBA experience would be the way it is. And so I wanted you to co comment on how has your experience changed during the, de the pandemic? Uh, what things have been different that you thought or what things have been you know, better? Um, just share some perspectives. I guess I can leave that off being the, the Zoomer here. <laughs> so yeah, just to give a context to that, uh, there, there are two kinds of students right now, given the situation, there are the rumors to get to be there in person in the physical world. And then there's me, the cyber guy, um, being a Zoomer. So I joined the classes uh, via Zoom. Um, 
Well, I guess, Sean, the, the way to approach it, at least in my end, was that, all right, so here's what's happening. There's a global crisis and, and things aren't as good as we'd like them to be. But uh, I kind of approach it from the perspective, okay, so what can I make out of this? What can I, how can I make this the best situation that it can be? So of course, and one of the things that came to my mind, right, well, this is the perfect time to actually take up my MBA. So, um, you know, Manila is one of the most traffic countries in the world. Uh, we spend so many hours in traffic every day, at least we did. Thanks to COVID, uh, everyone is working from home. So there's time to actually study, take up the MBA. And, uh, and, uh, but from, from a school perspective, we're taking advantage of the situation we're in. How can we help companies be more digital? How can we transition and do change management and ownership and, and negotiate with stakeholders so that companies can survive and thrive given the new situation? It is the new normal. It's not, uh, we might not be going back to the old normal even post-vaccine, um, but ASB has definitely made sure that not only my company survives but thrives in the situation. So I think it was a, it was an interesting experience, and I'm happy that I had ASB during this this critical period. So, uh, Mazra, you know, you had the ability to come to campus for a period of time before the most recent CMCO. What has been your experience in this COVID environment um, and, and how, has it, uh, how has it kind of impacted your experience and, and uh, your view of the, the program? Yeah, so, I mean, yes, I guess unlike Matt, uh, I have been lucky enough to come in for the first two weeks and after that, everything had to go online. But I think um, apart from the first two weeks where we got to at least uh, be in person with uh, the full-timers and the WPs who were here, uh, Honestly, staying in contact has not been difficult at all. Uh, going for classes has not been difficult at all. Like, for instance, Matt, he is my classmate. I've never, I've not met him in real life, but I think we chat nearly every day. Uh, you know, our, our WhatsApp group chats are, are just buzzing. You know, it's way more happening than any of my uh, friend chats. And there's just so much to share, so much to talk about. And, and in, in terms of staying engaged and, and communicating with your classmates, uh, just WhatsApp and, and just, and at times, for instance, uh, study teams and whatnot, you will just have Zoom calls or, or calls on MS Teams, you know, and it's a great way to stay in touch. Uh, it's a great way to study and, and discuss together and collaborate together. And yeah, so, and even having the, the MIT faculty teachers over Zoom, I mean, those classes are at night and most people would cringe at the thought of it. But actually, I found myself waking up towards, the, towards nighttime and being quite wired after class and not being able to sleep because it was, it's very engaging so far. And, and I think the professors and even the classmates, uh, you know, everybody makes it fun. Everybody is kind of in, you know, nobody's there with a kind of negative view. Everybody's just happy to be there, happy to learn, happy to engage. And the full-timers, a lot of them are still scattered all over the world. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm making friends with all of them on a daily basis. And so yeah, that's great. I, I feel uh, not being in person with one another is, is no longer a hindrance. No longer a hindrance to, to building relationships, to networking, to communicating or staying engaged. So, so um, you know, Mervlin, since we're running out of time, I want to just do one question per person uh, now. Uh, and, and so, uh, Mervlin, uh, so with the diversity in the program, uh, inside and outside the classroom, you know, one of the things I wanted to get a sense of is like, when, who have you been surprised that you've learned something with of a different background from you, whether it's from an industry perspective, cultural perspective, uh, anything, you know, along those lines that you're like, wow, I, didn't, I wasn't expecting to maybe be in a class with a person of this background or this perspective, and I took a lot from it. Do you have an example of that? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, yes, def definitely. But if I had to pick one, I think, um, you know, we, we are usually quite wired in a way that, you know, let's say uh, I'm, I'm a senior to Masra or I'm a senior to Matthew, but I realized that, um, talking to different people from different backgrounds, whether you're 
uh, in a senior class or a low or a junior class, uh, everyone has different experience and background. So I actually realized that um, I connected quite well with uh, a junior in the full time in in the full time program from Korea, and uh, because of her background in studying in the U.S., I think that gave a lot more insights on uh, how how to work in, with different companies in different contexts. And quite recently, I used that a lot in some of my negotiations with some of our vendors that's in an international market. So I think that that whole diversity of people uh, from around the world where you could just uh, connect with them and actually learn from them. Like Matthew said, um, the quality of students here are at another level. So you could really get a lot from just anyone. Okay, fantastic. Um, Mazra, what, what has been the most challenging element of your MBA experience so far? And I think I'll open this up to everyone after Mazra because I think this is a really good question. Yeah, so um, in the less than two months that uh, since we started the MBA, I'd say honestly, time management and energy levels. So being in the WP is, you know, you've got a full-time job, uh, you, but you also have to juggle the MBA at the same time. So you have to learn to balance it. And I won't pretend that the MBA is, is a breeze. You know, you will be working hard on both things. But at the same time, you know, you'll get into the swing of things. After two months, I think we've gotten into the swing of things. And you learn how to manage. And what you need to do is just, you know, kind of be, uh, you have communicate with your superiors at the office for sure they need to be aware of what your schedule is like and what your deliverables are uh, outside of the office and then you yourself need to take care of yourself you know you got if you have the chance to sleep get that sleep if you have the chance to to go and have a good meal take it because um it's not easy but it's been very very rewarding at the same time i must say so, so even if people say are you exhausted i'm like yes but i'm so excited <laughs> So, so when, when you talk about having to, you know, maybe sacrifice, what have you had to give up most on uh, in order to accommodate everything? Has it been sleep? Uh, has it been uh, food? Or, you know, what, what, what have you had to compromise on in order to fit everything in? Gym time. <laughs> gym time, okay. There is gym. no time for gym. <laughs> and oh, I'd, man. Say, I'd say you, you'd have to pick um, for the office, you know, and even at the MBA, you, you have to be smart about how you use your time. You know, you, you have to be quite efficient and productive. And, and maybe, yeah, you know, do the important things first. Get that out of the way before you, you tackle maybe slower or more menial and less important tasks. So, so I'm going to ask, uh, you know, this one's a good question for everything. What's been the most challenging thing for you, Merlin? Um, it's a full-time program with a full-time job. I think that's the best way to describe it. Uh, they don't shortchange you in terms of what you learn from uh, as compared to the full-timers. In fact, you're doing uh, about the same or even more than the full-timers at times uh, in terms of what you learn and your assignments and all. There's no discount uh, in that way. Uh, so you need to be able to manage both um, because your workload um, especially if you're also progressing in your career, it's not getting any less. In fact, it's adding up uh, a lot more. And I do understand now in this pandemic, uh, workload for most of us have increased. So um, that's quite a challenge just to learn how to prioritize and balance things out. What about you, Matthew? What's been the most challenging thing as a CEO and entrepreneur? Uh, sure. Um... Well, there's a lot of, the whole thing is a challenge, right? So, I mean, you're getting the, the like top education. So it's, I mean, on the onset, you know, it's not going to be easy. Um, but then again, doing like Merlin said so perfectly is this is a full-time MBA with a full-time job. So having to juggle that. But for me, the biggest challenge, Sean, was, um, you know, this whole ASB experience is kind of like the matrix, you know, where they jack me up to something and then within two weeks we know ops, right? So, uh, and then you have to go back into the real world and then see so many wrong things being done in your organization and like, um, 
it's so hard. I, I don't know how you guys do it that in two weeks you can like cram that information in and then you have to communicate to the normal people in the real world that, hey, this is how we should do things. This being that kind of like uh, transitioning back and forth from super high speed fire hydrant kind of education to then having to apply that. That's always a challenge. It's an exciting challenge. But for me, that was one of the biggest challenges of, of this whole experience. All right. Um, so we have a question from Alvin. He asks, what do you guys contribute back to ASB? Oh, um, there's so much, uh, Alvin. It's a great question. So um, I think one of the best things about ASB is this is, first and foremost, also a community. Uh, at least from the student's perspective. And if you just see the clubs that we have, you have the finance club, you have the community service club, you have the data analytics club, there's always something happening, right? For you to attend everything, you have to have like three versions of yourself. It is impossible to do that. But these are student-led programs. And, and you know, when I say student-led programs are really even better than the, the paid programs I have attended in the past. These are really awesome things. So ASB is kind of like, uh, it is as great as to what we put into it. So all the students are super active in their own way of contributing back. And, uh, and you know, there are so many things just for you to explore. What about you, Mervlin? Um. I never looked at it as contributing back to ASB. I think once you've done the program here and you immerse yourself in the whole experience, it's quite natural just to participate and get involved with uh, all the activities. Um, Matthew did a great job explaining in like with the student clubs, but I think the, the unique thing about ASB is also how close we are to the faculty. I think with Sean, uh, with, for me, it's like DW, Jules, um, even Professor Charlie, we could actually say hi to him or uh, with some of the other faculties go out for coffee. So, um, and just to exchange and see what else we can do back for the school. I don't think it's very, it's ever phrased that way, but it's always that, um, uh, that thing that we give. I think uh, one thing you guys would learn in networking is that um, it's not just to get something, it's always, uh, a, it's a very natural a relationship where where both people just work together. So that's that's how I guess you could put it in a way contribute back to ASB. What about you, Mazra? You're like a, a class rep. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, so um, yeah. So I've I've kind of I've I've gotten um elected as a as a interim class rep. Not yet um a full well the full blown thing, but yeah. So actually, what I find is that. Uh, you know, because the, the WPs are a slightly differently structured program. So you you also want to make sure that as much as the, the school has really done so much in kind of making sure FTs and WPs get kind of the same, same and different kind of uh, take from the school, uh, you also want to, to help because uh, the WP, this is only the second year. So I see as a way of, of contributing to how uh, you know, ASB is running and structuring the WP program, right? Like, uh, you know, as we go along in your second, in our sec, in uh, ASB second year of the WP, we kind of learn what works, what, um, you know, what gets tweaked slightly, what changes every semester, and what different types of students need. And I feel that, you know, the, as a, you know, someone saying in the chat that is, a, as, since it's a startup, right, in a sense, uh, there's so much more for ASB to learn from the WP students. And so, yeah, I, I feel that, you know, we are just helping to make the program even better than it already is. Yeah, I think one of the things, if I, if I could add something, as a startup business school, every student who comes here has an opportunity to leave a legacy. And, and one of the things that we always talk about is every year has been different at ASB because there are no sacred cows, right? Uh, People can come here. We're not a hundred year old business school where we're, you know, steeped in these certain traditions and these vestiges of yesteryear. We're able to innovate and we co-create with uh, the students to come up with the best version of our business school. Um, so Nash Ravin, uh, he asked, ASB as a startup of sort, where do you see yourself in a couple of years? Uh, and so, um, so I I'll answer this one and you guys can also answer. 
uh, we, we think we're going to be the best business school in Asia, no doubt about it. You know, I've, I've been in a, a lot of different, uh, I've worked at other schools in Asia, I've been on different industry boards. So I've had a chance to see all kinds of business schools. And not only, you know, I think what we're doing here is, is really setting the standard, not just for Asia, but for the rest of the world. Um, and so that, that's our aspiration. So uh, what we're trying to do is get better today than we were yesterday and get better tomorrow than we are today. What do you guys think of that question? I think it's great, yeah. I mean, I can see that every year on year, you guys tweak and tweak your program as it, as it, it you know, it suits the students, it suits um, the faculty. And then with COVID, you guys have just been uh, so flexible with working things out. And even the academic associates are also working around the clock to, you know, something for the WP, something for the FT, you know, we want different exam times from the FTs, all sorts, you know, so I think you guys are, are well on your way to, to becoming the, one of the best schools here. And um, yeah, if people, every time people ask me, I'm like, guys, this school is great, seriously. So uh, Carla has a great question that I think uh, is, is really important. How did you get support of your company management to do the MBA? Uh, program. Any thoughts, advice, recommendations, strategies? Uh, so, um, well, since I'm not mute, not on mute, uh, I'll go first. So, for me, actually, it was um, it was actually it was interesting because my company actually heard about ASB and and were looking around for people to sponsor, right? So, I know there's there are some companies that kind of open up. Uh, spaces, you know, they say, okay, I want to sponsor one or two or three students, uh, employees to become students. And then there are companies who, who you know, the students are either self, uh, self-paying or, or they go to their, their company and ask them for sponsorship, right? So, uh, I mean, so one thing is the sponsorship uh, part. And the other thing, I guess, uh, a key concern would be the time off, right? So yeah, number one, I think your HR needs to be fully on board with this. Your HR needs to be informed. And, and I understand that HR, your HR will have um, you know, a lot of access to ASB. They can talk to the admin in ASB to fully understand um, you know, what the time off would be like and just a, an idea of your schedules and whatnot. Uh, and your own managers, your own superiors, your teammates, everybody. I think you must uh, keep them informed. You must keep them, uh, engage with them and let them know what your schedule is like, what you need to do. And, you know, the support of everybody, because if they don't support you, it will be quite hard. But, uh, you know, if, if you're interested in joining next year, start now, start putting those, planting those seeds in your superior's head. And one of the things you can do, and I'll put up a schedule call link later, but um, you can work with us and uh, we have experience talking with corporate partners, even if you're not a sponsor company like Mazra's, We've also had a chance to talk to companies and um, you know get more support for you. All right. Um, any, any thoughts about any other thoughts about getting support, Mervyn, Mervyn, and uh, Matthew? Yeah, I think you first um, you got to set expectations and like Masra said, um, start engaging early because you will be engaging uh, with them throughout your whole two years in ASB. Um, you need to set the expectations. I think we mentioned a few times that um, this is not a weekend program. So sometimes that expectation doesn't get to your superior that this is a quite uh, intense program. So once you set that expectations, continue to engage with them. And um, sometimes uh, we do understand not everything in the world is perfect, that you do need help. I think we do have people in ASB that you reach out to and they've they are the ones that's always engaging with your company. So um, anything that is, you really do need help. I think for the WPs, we have Jules who would actually reach out and immediately speak to your superior if it ever reaches that level. Sometimes it doesn't reach that level, um, but um, there needs to be some clarification like between the school and your work. um, So the school can actually step in. And um, you'll meet Jules at another, we will at another event we have scheduled in the future. So you have a chance. Matthew, your situation is different. Everyone would think the CEO is the boss, right? But I'm sure you have other bosses, be it family or other commitments. How did you manage expectations with them? 
All right, well, there is a few things to, to take a look at, right, Sean? So uh, I do have a board I have to report to. So that's a very important uh, uh, group of stakeholders I have to convince. Uh, because the last thing you want for your CEO is to be distracted, right, from running the company. So uh, th those are the things that I had uh, heard those I had to do or had to overcome. Uh, there's also the, but I think there's something I can share that would also help not just only the entrepreneurs, but also the the career or working professionals in a way, because I had to take a look at it from a return of investment standpoint, like learning all these things, what sort of skills will I get and how will that translate into my company? I think that's something that likes a business case, but it, instead of looking at it from, from a project, you're looking at it from yourself. What, what will your company get when you graduate from ASV? What sort of skills will you be able to contribute back to your company? And how do you quantify those things, right? So those are very difficult, sharp skills that you have to apply and then translate that into smart skills by explaining that to your stakeholders. And if you can do that, then you're, you're, <laughs> then you're a good fit for ASV. Um, and uh, I think, I think uh, having your company see it from that perspective as well, not just from your, from your personal perspective, will help you get that sponsorship. Great. So I'm going to close with one last question for you guys. Uh, three months before the program, what would you have done differently knowing what you know now? I would have slept more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Sorry, in a pre-COVID world, you know, take that holiday, take that break, take do whatever it is you wanted to do. Um, but with COVID around, I'd say, you know, make the most of your free time, but get ready and, and get excited. Matthew? Oh, um, that's a hard question, Sean, right? So there's so many things that I, I don't want to redo. But I, I think uh, you can never be fully prepared enough. There's... And you think you, you come into ASB thinking you're good at quant, and then you meet Professor Xin Jin, and then you know you get <laughs> you get the stuffing knocked out of you. You think you're good at ops, and you meet Professor Charlie. So there, there's so many things that you can prepare. And one of the hardest lessons to learn was that a lot of the business books that you read out there, they're they're you know nowhere near um, <laughs> the caliber that we experience here. And I wish I knew the books like of Professor Sternman and. And, and clock speed by Professor Fine and all those things. So many things I could have just prepared to just make life a little bit easier for me. Um, but even if it's so difficult, uh, it is difficult because it is the best program and you're expected to be the best graduate. So uh, it is what it is. And it's an awesome experience. It's a fun experience. So I don't regret any of it. Fantastic. And, and Mervyn, as the elder statement. <laughs> Train your team because you would really rely on your team once uh, you leave and study. <laughs> I, I would have right. differently the three months before. I would spend more time training the team. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, preparing for the experience. Like a lot of times, one of the things we see, uh, I'm going to tell this to the applicants here. Most of the applicants come in at the last minute and you're doing yourself a disservice because if you can prepare for the program, getting work together, putting your, getting your team right, getting that last vacation in, right? Making sure the board knows everything. Uh, you're gonna be able to extract even more value from the MBA experience here. So um, I'd love to, uh, I'd like to give a virtual round of applause for our student panelists. Uh, they were amazing today. Thank you so much guys for your insights. I think this was super helpful for the audience. We have a couple of events coming up. Uh, if, uh, if you want to participate in any of our regional online uh, access events uh, with Glenar and Fazilla, you can do that. Um, also, we have some events related to our, uh, you know, with the MCB program, the Masters of Central Banking program that we're launching, you know, we're able to demonstrate this kind of financial and economic expertise that we have in our faculty. Uh, we're partners with the IMS, so we're, uh, we're having a session on December 2nd about uh, 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 IMF advice on capital flows uh, with our faculty and, and guests and friends of the program. Also on the 9th, uh, we're building a, a resilience and policy framework in a COVID world. So Dr. Tansri Zeddy, the former governor of Bank Nagara, Malaysia and the, 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 the matriarch of our, our school and the visionary will be there along with Sir uh, Paul Tucker, author of Unelected Power 
And so very high profile speakers. So feel free to scan a QR code to get information to participate in these events. These are just a sample of some of the great things that are going on at ASB. Also, if you want to schedule a call and talk to us, uh, you can schedule a call and set up a time with me or the broader admissions team. Uh, Jules, who wasn't here today, and Emily, who aren't here today, uh, they're also available. So if you want to uh, find someone else who, you know, get to explore and know more of the ASB uh, team, feel free to do so. And so thank you every, uh, very much, guys. We got our questions in. And uh, good night to everybody. All right. Take care. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good luck with your applications. Thank you. Bye. Bye.